How did your ministry dreams become a nightmare? Let's chat about that. Back in a moment. I think the vast majority of us who decide to go into either part-time or full-time ministry in the church go into it with dreams. We go into it with some ideas of what it's going to look like and how it's going to be. Perhaps we go into a church and we're thinking we're going to grow that church to a certain number. We're going to write a number of books. Maybe we'll become famous. I don't know what the particular dream is. Maybe you're somebody who just enjoys the whole idea of being a pastor and preaching sermons on Sunday to a congregation of whatever size. But if you've been in ministry any amount of time, you begin to realize that the dreams you had when you started probably aren't coming into fruition. What can make it worse is if you're somebody like me after many, many, many years in ministry, you begin to think back and say, what happened? What happened to all of that education, all of that experience, all of that training? Was all of that for this? Is what I'm doing right now really that significant that I needed all of that training, all of that challenge, all of that suffering, all of that sacrifice just to bring me to this point? It just seems silly, doesn't it? Due to discouragement, loneliness, money issues, family problems, things like COVID, we've seen an alarming amount of ministers who frankly uncall themselves and leave the ministry to do something else. Why does that happen? Well, this is one of the reasons that I started this podcast to try to encourage ministers, especially those who are ministering in the church, to hang in there even though things may not look the way you want them to look. There was a speaker a number of years ago that I heard as a young man, and he said something that stayed with me through many decades, honestly. It didn't really mean that much to me at the time, but over the years it came to mean quite a bit more to me. He said these words, If you stay where God puts you, He'll know where to find you when He wants you. Those words, if you think about them, are profound. Many of us, when we get into pressure situations, want to find a way out as quickly as we can. And oftentimes the way out is to stay put. I can't tell you the number of pastors who look at that phrase, when the going gets tough, the tough gets going, and they interpret it to mean, I better get out of here. <laughs> that's, not the, that's not the purpose of that phrase. When the going gets tough, it means dig in deeper. It means get uh, stronger in what you're doing, not vacate the premises. Many pastorates have been vacated by pastors who just said, you know, I've had it. I'm not going to put up with all the hassles with people who are criticizing me. I'm not going to be putting up with the challenges that I have with my family. I'm not going to be putting up with not being paid enough. I deserve more than this. My training deserves more than this. And there's certainly a balance. I know there are church situations where church boards and or people who are exercising influence in the church can have such a negative effect that there really is no alternative except to leave that congregation. The congregation itself needs to die. It's lost its vision. It's lost its uh, desire to serve the Lord. There are those circumstances. It can be really challenging for those of us who are pastors when we look at the circumstances that we're in and we look at our training and we look at all of the things we've been through and we say, what am I doing this? Can't I be doing something else? Wouldn't my life be spent better uh, doing something else? How do we navigate through feelings like that? Well, of course, where do we go but to the scriptures? And we find example after example after example of men of God who went through very much similar circumstances as us. We may not identify with people like Elijah, but some of those circumstances are very similar. Here's a man who had tremendous ministry. I mean, again, you see the amazing things that happened with the prophets of Baal and, and just a display of God's power. And we've probably preached this even a number of times, where after that experience, after this incredible high of seeing the power of God move on a nation in such an incredible way, he finds himself running away from Jezebel. He becomes frightened for his life, and he starts running. Let me get out of here. It didn't work out the way I thought it would. 
now that I've shared these messages, now that I've showed that God is the real God, now they'll recognize me. Now they'll recognize my ministry. Now I will really be in the place I'm supposed to be that I was born for. I'm going to occupy a place of influence from now on in this government. We're going to see this government turn around and change. And instead, the government comes after him and says, if we find you, we're going to kill you. And he finds himself running for his life. And we all know the story. He ran and ran and ran and found himself in a cave. And when he got there, what does God say? What are you doing here? What are you doing here? And he goes on to an explanation of saying, well, I'm here because of all these things that have happened. And I'm the only one left. I'm the only one who really cares about the ministry. No one else cares like I do. I've done all this for God and it's not worked out. And now I'm all alone and nothing's working out and boo hoo. And instead of God saying, there, there, Elijah, <laughs> instead he says, get to work. Get to work. You don't belong in a cave. You don't belong feeling sorry for yourself. Get back out there. I've got some things for you to do. And interestingly enough, the things that he had for him to do were definitely not what Elijah had in mind. First of all, I want you to go over to one of Israel's enemies, and I want you to appoint the next leader there. And then, oh, by the way, I want you to appoint your own successor because you're going to have to leave the planet soon. <laughs> I'm sure that wasn't very comforting to Elijah. I think he was thinking, well, God wants to put me back in the ministry. Now I can go back to doing what I was doing before. And now God's saying, well, you know, maybe you're right. Maybe you need to leave the planet. <laughs> I don't think that's what he had in mind. And he says, go and appoint somebody. And so he sends him and says, I want you to appoint somebody to be your successor. Who does he choose to be his successor? Not another prophet, a farmer. I think the equivalent, if we looked at it today, would be find a truck driver. Find somebody who has no religious background, who spends his day basically pushing a truck, or pushing oxen in this case, that doesn't really have any religious experience. I want him to be your successor. He's the one that I want you to train to be the person who's going to take over your ministry. And then I've got some other things to do for, with you that are not even related to this planet. I know that probably wasn't as very comforting to Elijah as perhaps he had hoped. But you know, God has an agenda for your life. He has an agenda for my life. And it typically is not what we had imagined. If you stay where God puts you, he'll know where to find you when he wants you. Every one of us who have been called to ministry, like it or not, have been called to the cross. Someone once described the cross as where our will and God's will cross and he wins. Where God wants to take you in ministry is not necessarily up, but down. When you look at the life of Paul, for example, we celebrate him certainly as being one of the greatest of all ministers of the gospel, but you look at his life, beaten, rejected, maligned, criticized, misunderstood, arrested. I mean, the, the list goes on and on and on. If you really look at his life day to day, he did not have an easy life. But the fruit of his ministry, my goodness, has spanned thousands of years and will go right into eternity. God means to do that with each of us. The fruit that we're really looking for, the, the fruit that we're dreaming of, is probably not the fruit that God had in mind. I remember very early in my ministry that uh, a very seasoned minister would spend some time with me from time to time. He was a traveling minister. And in our times together, he'd say to me, Casey, the real gift you have is to love other people, to love on other people with everything you have. Now, back in those days, my basic gift, as you've heard, if you've been on this podcast any amount of time, my basic gift was teaching. And if you've ever met somebody who's really a teacher, a teacher mindset and a teacher who's really after that gift, Love is not usually at the center of a teaching gift. It's getting things correct. It's getting things in order. It's getting things to function correctly. And oftentimes teachers are annoyed by people. They're annoyed by the church itself because it never functions perfectly. It never follows order. It never follows scripture. You find that when you interact with people that they, they're always screwing up. They're always making mistakes. They're always not following through on the teaching you gave them. And it can be very aggravating. And here was a seasoned minister who was saying, your greatest gift to these people, Casey, is love on them. 
you know, that word has gone down through decades. Again, I've been in the ministry over four decades at this time in my life. And more and more and more, I find that when God begins to move, what he calls me to do is to love on people, particularly to love on other ministers, to love on people who maybe are not loved by other people, that love does conquer more than we can even imagine. And loving on people and understanding people and giving people encouragement can sometimes be more important than all the teaching in the world. And I have found through the years of ministry that I've had that that gift of teaching, although it's a way that God does use me in the ministry, most of what God does through me is not through teaching, but loving other people, caring for other people, doing things that I was not comfortable with doing. If you stay where God puts you, he'll know where to find you when he wants you. God may have you in a place right now that's very obscure. Maybe no one appreciates your ministry. Maybe your church is a small church and it's not as big as you would imagine. Maybe you look at other ministries and they seem to be excelling while you're not seeming to move at all. And you think to yourself, what am I doing? All of this education, all of this experience, all of the challenges, all of the sacrifice, this is what it was all about? No, that isn't what it's all about. It was really all about getting you to be a place where you are God's servant. That you can say, yes, Lord, if you want me to minister to one person, and that's my ministry, that's my talent, that's good enough for me. That wherever you have me is fine by me, as long as I know I'm in the center of your will. I can tell you that when it comes to the flesh, I'm sure you've learned this as being in the ministry, when it comes to the flesh, your flesh will never be satisfied with anything you do. There's always this desire, there's always a desire within our flesh to be seen, to be recognized, to be affirmed, to get all of those things. But more often than not, the Holy Spirit is calling us to a place of the cross, which is giving up that affirmation, giving up that need for other people to appreciate us, giving up that need for everyone to recognize us, but coming to that place where only God's approval matters. Because when he has you in that place, he can trust you. And here's the thing about trust. When God can trust you, then he can send you and he can speak through you. Because he knows you're not speaking on your own, but you're speaking only what you hear the Father telling you to do, just like Jesus. You're not so much interested in what people are going to think. You're not interested in trying to get people's approval. You're only interested in delivering what God wants you to deliver. Your sermons get better. Your ministry gets better. Everything about you gets better because it's no longer about you. It's about him. If you stay where God puts you, he'll know where to find you when he wants you. I hope that's been an encouragement to you today. Before we go, you know, I end each podcast with a quote especially for you. This one is from St. Augustine, who said, The sole purpose of life is to gain merit for life in eternity. Simple but true. Until next time. Hey, before you go, can you please leave me a comment, like, and subscribe? I would greatly appreciate it.